it said that variables hold values. But another way to think about it is that a variable is a human readable name that refers to some data in memory. We are going to take a second here and take a peek down the rabbit hole of pointers, but my friend, don't worry about that. You can think of memory as a big array of bytes. A byte is typically an 8-bit binary number. Think of it as an integer that can only hold the values from 0 to 255, inclusive. Technically, C allows byte to be any number of bits. And if you really want unambiguously to refer to an 8-bit number, you should use the term octet. But of course, my friend, don't get me wrong. Programmers are going to assume you mean 8 bits when you say a byte, unless you specify otherwise. So data is stored in this quote-unquote array. Of course, this is an oversimplification of the real thing, but this is a very good mental model to understand what is really going on. If a number is larger than a single byte, it is stored in multiple bytes, for example, the number 256. Because at the end of the day, memory is just a big array, each byte of memory can be referred by its index. And this index, my friend, is also called an address, a location, or a pointer, yeah, pointers. So when you have a variable in C, the value of that variable is in memory, somewhere, some address. After all, where else would it be? But it's really a pain to refer to a value by its numeric address, so we make a name for it instead. And that's what a variable is. So TLDR, a variable is just a name, a tag for us programmers, for some data that is stored in memory at some address, location, pointer. Depending on which languages you already have in your toolkit, you might or might not be familiar with the idea of types, and C is kind of picky about them. Let's write here a very simple C code with some variables. So before you can use a variable, you have to declare that variable and tell C what type the variable holds. Once declared, the type of the variable cannot be changed later at runtime. So here I declare an integer that I call i, and then I declare a float that I call f. So these can be whatever integer value, for example, 1, 10, 42, 1337, 0, and also of course negative, like minus 42, minus 10 and so on. A float is a real number, like for example pi, 3.14 or minus 3.14. So here we have declared a couple of variables. We haven't used them yet. Indeed, here I have a warning. It's telling me, hey, this variable isn't used. Why you did write in the code if you are not using that? And indeed, these variables are uninitialized. And this is kind of weird in C, because if I print the value of these two variables with percent %d and percent %f. These are conversion specifiers for an integer and a float. Here's the new line. And I pass i and f. If I compile the code and I run this, I will get one and all zeros for the float. This is very strange, right? Because I've never assigned one to i. Right? Indeed, uninitialized variables have indeterminate, garbage, random, call as you want values. They have to be initialized or else you must assume they contain some nonsense number. This is one of the places where C can get you. So now let's assign a value to these variables. I'm gonna say int i assign, this is the assign operator, the value 42, for example. And here I assign the value 3.14. Now I save this and if I compile again and launch, you will see that I get 42 and 3.14. So basically here I have a declaration of a variable. I'm telling a compiler, I want an integer. Call this integer i, this is the tag name for me as a programmer and assign the value 42 to the is integer. So somewhere in memory, I get this value stocked. Here I say, compiler, just give me a float, a real number, call this float f and assign the value 3.14 to this variable. Then just print the value of these variables. We're going to do that by passing two arguments to the printf function. The first argument is a string that describes what to print and how to print. This string here, 
which is called a format string. These are the actual values to print, namely the variable i and the variable f. If you want to know more about the printf function, I made an entire series about this function. But basically, we have that printf unts through the format string for a variety of special sequences, which start with a percent sign, right? So it's gonna search for these percent signs. They're telling printf what to print. For example, if it finds percent %d, it looks to the next parameter that we passed and prints it out as an integer, namely this i. If it finds percent %f, like in this case, it's gonna print this f as a float, of course. If it's gonna find an s, it's gonna print a string. So let's declare a string in C, which is just a pointer. We will see, hello. And here, if I do uh, percent %s and I pass the actual string, I compile again and launch and boom as you can see i get the integer the real number and the string d as boolean types true or false well the response is one what do i mean by that well historically c didn't have a boolean type and some might argue it still doesn't indeed in c zero means false and non-zero means true every value which is different from zero is true so one is true minus 37 is true and zero is false. Well, given that we are dealing with electricity, with transistors turning on and off, you can think of truth like light. If there is presence of light, it means that the value is true. When there is no light, it means false. That's a good mental model to have. Given that it may be intuitive to think about negative values as falsehood, right? This is not the case, given that minus 37 is true is exactly the value 1 or 42 or whatever value. Let's have a look at this very simple program. As you can see, I declare a variable x, which is an integer, and I assign to it the value 42, which is just a random value that I decided. Then I say if x, right, this is a conditional. Basically, I'm telling if x is true, and we just said that every value which is different from 0 is truth so of course i'm gonna get inside this block and i'm gonna run the function put string that is gonna write x is true so you can see that booleans are just integers on the end of the day in the second case i directly declare a boolean i say bool y equal true i can do that just including the standard boolean header file including this header file I get access to some symbolic names that actually make things look more familiar, right? Because we can use a bool type and true and false values. But underneath the hood, everything is just numbers. So if I read true or 42 or minus 37, these are exactly the same. Of course, writing true is more intelligible, is more readable, makes more sense. So this is just a facade to make things look better, look nicer. If we compile this code, and we launch it, you see that x is true, namely this function has been triggered, as well as y is true, right? Because this function has been triggered. Now, if we change the value here to minus 42, we get exactly the same result. Nothing really changes. On the contrary here, if I put zero, compile and launch only y. So these are booleans. C also includes the ternary operator. This is an expression whose value depends on the result of a conditional embedded in it. Let me make a very simple example. I will declare two integers. So I do int x, comma, and y. I assign the value to x, let's say 42, and to y, I assign zero. Then I say y plus equal, and here I want to use the ternary operator. Basically, I want to say if x is major than 10, you're gonna increase y plus 17, otherwise plus 37. Well, let's write the condition. Here I say, is x major than 10? If I do x major than 10, question mark, this is the condition. If this is the case, the return value has to be 17. On the contrary, here I use a colon, the return has to be 37. Boom, done. Let's read this boy again. Here is written, is x major than 10? If this is the case, if this is true, return me 17. On the contrary, return me 37. 
right? This is what is written in this weird expression. So as you can see, the notation is kind of weird, but once you get used to it, it's kind of simple. You have a condition, which is in this case, X major than 10. You can also use braces to make it simpler to read. Then the question mark, which really helps to decode this word expression. The number before the colon, if the condition is true, on the contrary, we have the number just after the call. Now, you may have noticed that this is kind of redundant, right? We already have conditionals. We have if else constructs to do these kind of things. And indeed, this expression is actually equal to this if then else construct. The semantic meaning is exactly the same. So it's fairly simple to see how you can jump from an if then else to a ternary operator. Personally, I really like the ternary operator because it's really compact. In one single line, you get a lot of work done, right? Because with an if then else, you have four lines, like in this case. Arguably, the ternary operator, on the contrary, is more difficult to read. But once you see many times this kind of expression, it's going to become second nature. Now, it's important to note that the ternary operator isn't control flow, like the if statement, for example. It is an expression that evaluates to a value. If you have any doubts between the difference between expressions and statements, I highly suggest to you this video. Now, let's mess with another thing that you might not have seen. These are the legendary post increment and post decrement operators. I'm talking about I++. This is going to add one to I and I minus minus. This is going to subtract one from I. These are very commonly used in C and they are just shorter versions of I plus equal one and I minus equal one. But the thing is that they're not the same thing. Let's discover together the subtleties about this post increment and decrement. To do that, let's take a look at this variant, the pre-increment and pre-decrement. So plus plus i semicolon minus minus i semicolon. With pre-increment and pre-decrement, the value of the variable is incremented or decremented before the expression is evaluated. Then the expression is evaluated with the new value. With post increment and post decrement, the value of the expression is first computed with the value as is, and then the value is incremented or decremented after the value of the expression has been determined. Let's see a very practical example. In this very simple program, I'm going to declare two integer variables that I call i and j. I then assign the value 10 to the variable i, and then I say j is equal to i plus plus post increment, what is going to be the value of j in your opinion. Compiling and running this code, I get 11 and 10. So i is equal to 11, but j is equal to 10. Now let's change this to a pre-increment like that. Let's do the same thing as before. Boom. This time I get 11 and 11. You see the catch. With the prefix increment, the number i is going to be incremented by one before the current expression is evaluated. So in this specific case, before assigning the value i to j, i is going to be incremented. This is not the case with a post increment, where i is going to be assigned to j before i is going to be incremented. If you want to know more about postfix and prefix, I've wrote an article about that. I'll leave you the link in the description. The comma operator is an uncommonly used way to separate expressions that will run a left to right. Now, I'm going to make a super simple example to grasp this concept. Given the statement x is equal to brace 1, 2, 3, brace semicolon. Following the precedence, we have to resolve, first of all, the expression brace 1, 2, 3, right? As I told you, comma is an operator that is separating expressions. So the first expression is going to be 1. So this expression is going to return me back 1 and the value then is going to be discarded. We are left with 2 comma 3. The expression 2 is going to return me the value 2 of course and then discard it. We are left with the expression 3 and this is going to be the actual value that is going to be assigned to the variable x. Beware this is true only because we have braces. 
and with the comma operator we have resolution of expressions from left to right. Let's change a little bit. This time we don't have braces. And if we were a parser, a compiler, we see different operators. We see the assignment operator and then the commas. And respecting the operator's precedence, I made a video about that if you wanna dig down. The first operation that is gonna be performed is the assignment. So it's gonna be x equal one. So immediately after the assignment, I get that x is equal to one. Then the following expression is gonna be resolved. So I get two, it's gonna return me back the value two, of course, that is gonna be discarded as well for the value three. Done. So let's try to run this code. As long as you understood what is gonna be the value of x in this case. And we get, of course, one. But now if we change this and we add some braces, as we did previously, and we run again this code, this time we will get the value three. So TLDR, the comma operator is a separator of expressions. It is not very often used. It's just good practice to know what it is, but it's not gonna be extremely useful for you. Loops are super easy. It's just telling the computer what to do many times. This is a very basic computer science idea. One thing that I want to show you is just that a for loop is syntactic sugar for a while loop. What do I mean? Well, look at this very simple example. We declare an integer i and assign the value zero to that. And I say while i is minor than 10. What do you do? You just print i and then you just increment i with a prefix increment. Very cool. Now look at the visual. It's very, very easy to switch between a for loop and a while loop. As you can see, a for loop is much more compact. Everything is just inside the braces. I have the declaration of the variable i and the assignment of the value zero, then the condition i minor than 10 and the increase. You can see that everything is embedded inside a for loop. So if you want to write very compact code, use a for loop. But at the end of the day, they are exactly the same thing nothing really changes. So you may have encountered for the first time the switch statement. It is pretty simple. It is almost like the if then else conditional construct control flow. In this video, I would like to show you that the similarities are pretty big and you can switch very easily from an if then else and switch statement. Look at that. Here we have the keyword switch, the input which is goat count and the actual cases Namely, if we have one goat, we're going to jump into the case one. If none of these cases is going to be true, we jump into the default case. Now, to go from this to an if then else is almost trivial, right? That's why you don't see very often the switch statement in code. Usually the if then else construct you use. It is more readable indeed, right? Now, there are some subtleties with the switch statements. And for that, I suggest you this video that is going to explain you very well why the switch statement is particularly fast 